another eight millimeter film of San Francisco right after the earthquake that he displayed at, at the Silent Film Festival. So I think he's gonna be showing that too, and it's an amazing bit of footage. So you can find out about all that from talking to me, pick up a flyer for the Research Center, our Maritime Park. Whew, okay, that's all the self-promotion. Now let's get to why you're really here. Uh, so I've known Pierce for three or so years, maybe something like that, and uh, he never ceases to amaze me. All of you who know him probably know that, that well. Um, recently, at the beginning of summer, he told me, uh, did you know I was going to go to China to be an intern at Maritime Museum? I'm like, no, but of course not you are. <laughs> well, not surprised if you told me you were going to Mars to be an intern there, and you would have wrote a very nice cover letter and everything. So uh, I'm just excited. I'm so excited for you because I see all these opportunities that you have, and it's just really exciting to think that, you know, started out here, I like to say. Well, I'm sure you probably started out in schools. And everything, but let's face it. Uh, and uh, I, I like to say, um, uh, you'd asked me for a reference a while back, which I so willingly and happily gave. Uh, and part of the reason why is because I realized that at some point in my life, I'll be asking you for a reference. <laughs> so uh, don't forget old Gia, the research center. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, uh, the man you all know and love, Pierce. Thank you, Gina, so much for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming tonight to hear about the China Maritime Museum in Shanghai, China. My name is Pierce McDonald, and I've recently returned from a two-month fellowship at the China Maritime Museum. What I hope to do tonight is to convey some of my excitement for what I've learned this summer uh, at the, uh, in Shanghai to you at this talk. I'm originally from San Francisco, and I'm now a student at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. This summer, I was honored to receive a fellowship to study my favorite subject, maritime history. And the China Maritime Museum is an amazing place. And I could try to start describing it, but I think I just want to show you this quick video, uh, which is played on loop as people enter the museum, because I think this will give you a feel for what it's all about. Chuanyu 掌握全程航海知识海市防卫尽享生活、娱乐休闲 Now I'm sure you're all quite excited to know more about this exciting museum. But first I think it may be useful to provide some context about the city of Shanghai where this museum is located. I'd first like to say that I thought it was fascinating to study the ancient history of maritime, uh, the ancient maritime history in China while living and working in the world's busiest container port. <laughs> in addition to being a bustling hub for trade, Shanghai is also quite densely populated. 
the population of the city of Shanghai is about the same as the population of the U.S. state of Texas. So this here is the city of Shanghai uh, overlaid with an image of uh, that line of Texas. <laughs> so imagine the, the population of Texas in the area that's the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> so I knew this was a busy city that I was going to as I prepared for my travels. In my mind, I was picturing crowded subways, skyscrapers, a people mountain, people sea. But I was surprised to find that where I lived was actually nothing like this. The area that, uh, that where I worked was a land of green parks and wide, quiet streets. What most people think of as Shanghai is this downtown uh, region here uh, with the tall skyscrapers and famous buildings. And where I was was way down here, <laughs> at this, this lake uh, where, the, uh, where the museum is located. And so that's where you see this photo here. The two large sails in the background are the unique architecture of the China Maritime Museum. And you can see that there's a large green park uh, next to it. So while the public transit in Shanghai is very efficient and speedy, this is still a two hour trip from downtown, uh, the downtown area. And it's, for now, it's still quite sparsely populated because it's been built up in recent years, but uh, not many people have moved uh, here from the, from the city center. Now, the China Maritime Museum has some similarities to other maritime museums that I've been to before, such as the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park, but there also are some differences. Well, I'd first I'd like to say that one of, the, uh, one of the similarities is that there are a lot of uh, similar outreach event programs. So just uh, last Saturday, there was the Festival of the Sea uh, here at the uh, San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. And uh, many people came to experience what it was like to live as a sailor, tried out all these different uh, activities. And similarly, at the China Maritime Museum this summer, there was an event called the Festival of Life at Sea. And it was a similar chance for people from all walks of life to come to the museum and try out uh, a lot of different fun activities. So the main difference in the, in the museums is their scope. The San Francisco Maritime Museum is primarily a local history museum, primarily focused on the San Francisco Bay Area. Whereas the China Maritime Museum uh, covers thousands of years of history over all the regions of China. So there's a lot that they combine to put into this museum. And there are uh, exhibition halls on both prehistoric vessels as well as the latest developments in container shipping. So the China Maritime Museum has a very wide spread of uh, museum exhibitions. Another one of the differences is the uh, size of the museum. The China Maritime Museum is the National Maritime Museum of China. And so it has a staff of 400 people. And on my first day at the museum, I was just astounded. I uh, went to the museum cafeteria to have my breakfast. Then I walked through the, all the museum offices behind the, behind the building. And every day throughout the summer, I was meeting, meeting new people because there's just so many people on the, on the museum staff. But this makes sense when you consider the fact that uh, this is the National Maritime Museum for China. Whereas in the United States, there are many different maritime museums, such as where we are here in the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park which all uh, have one piece of the maritime history of the United States. Each of these blue anchors represents a different maritime history museum. So uh, these uh, 90 some, about 90 museums comprise the Council of American Maritime Museums. So these were some of the uh, similarities and differences between the China Maritime Museum and those that I'd seen before. How did I become interested in maritime history? Well, you may have heard of my interest in the ship uh, J.B. Stetson. J.B. Stetson was owned by my great-grandfather when it wrecked in 1934. And here's a photo of my great-grandfather standing in front of the J.B. Stetson on the day that the ship wrecked. 
<laughs> so in the process of researching this story, I traveled ac across the West Coast to visit many different maritime museums and libraries, and that was when I first uh, learned about the San Francisco Maritime Museum, our San Francisco Maritime National <laughs> Historical Park Research Center, where we all are right now. Uh, and so I uh, began to learn about this wonderful place then, and that was when I became interested in maritime history. I continued my venture into this subject by interning at a company called Marine Chartering. Marine Chartering is a marine brokerage and international shipping company. While I was working there, I learned about the modern side of, of shipping about container ships, modern chartering of vessels, and selling of container ships. And so that, I thought, was a really fascinating balance to the history side. It may seem sometimes like maritime history is something of the past and that shipping is, is something of, of olden times. But in fact, as I'm sure you know, that shipping is still very important in our daily lives. And 90% uh, of everything, all the products that we use, was carry on a container ship. So I started this research about the J.B. Stetson, which made me interested in maritime history. Then I uh, interned at this company, and then I went to college in Minnesota, at Carleton College. And it was at Carleton College in Minnesota that I heard about an opportunity called the Chang Land Fellowship. The Chang Land Fellowship provides an opportunity for students to research a topic of their choosing in China. So of course, I wanted to choose maritime history. And I'll first uh, play a quick video from the manager of this fellowship, Michael Wenderoth, in which he explains his, his purpose for, for funding this fellowship. The Chang Lan Fellowships were established by my mother, Judy Chang Wenderoth, in memory of my grandparents, uh, her parents, uh, Chen Wei Lan and Sing Chen Chang. The fellowships are aimed and go to students uh, first and foremost uh, and they're to fuel um, cross-cultural understanding uh, of China through experiential learning and a key component is that the students come back and share uh, with the larger community about what they've done over the summer. So Mr. Wenderoff is a 1993 graduate of Carleton College and also a graduate of the Stanford MBA program He's currently an executive coach and has a lot of experience with business in China. And in a recent article that he wrote in Forbes, he said, regardless of your age, you should be prepared for a lifetime of an escapable engagement with China. <laughs> for me, this age was three years old when <laughs> my parents enrolled me in the oldest management immersion program, uh, Chinese American International School, <coughs> which is here in San Francisco. That's me, right there. <laughs> <laughs> to study, study in China through a uh, federal government language scholarship. I was very grateful this summer to, uh, to have the opportunity to con continue my study uh, both of Chinese language and culture as well as maritime history. I had known for a long time that I wanted to study maritime history in China. And when I got in contact with the China Maritime Museum about six months before I began my travels, they were very open to the idea of me working at their museum. And this summer, my hope was finally realized, and I found that I was warmly welcomed as part of the museum staff. I worked in the education department, and there's several people from the education department here. And here we are on one of the, this big um, ship called the Fu Junk, which I'll describe in more detail later. A great, great crew of people. My mentor at the museum was Mr. Song Ka. Mr. Song took me under his wing and was always eager to explain fascinating details about Chinese maritime history, uh, to 
recite poems that he knew, or just explain the many details of how operations worked at the museum. And so I'm very grateful to Mr. Song for all that he taught me. Having now spent two months at the China Maritime Museum, I'd like to introduce you to some of its collections. The first thing that I'd like to introduce is the huge centerpiece of the museum's collection, the life-size Fu Junk. This is just a model. <laughs> but uh, I, the ship itself is very large, and it takes up most of the space in the museum. And so I was trying to find the right angle to take a photo. And I realized I really couldn't capture the scale of the ship uh, with any photo. So I'll have, to, I'll have some photos of the real ship later. But I just wanted to take a, use this photo of the model first to give you an image of what the ship looks like. You can see it has uh, three large junk rig sails. Um, and you can, uh, you can also see on the back, it has a uh, large uh, painting of a bird, which is an auspicious animal uh, for painting on, uh, on, ship, on the ship. But now let me show you a photo of the real thing. So here is what it looks like. As I said, it's kind of hard to get a full impression of the scale of this vessel. But this is the uh, deck of the vessel. And here is um, and the upper, upper portion of the vessel, below which are the, the captain's cabin and some other uh, facilities in the lower floor. One thing you'll notice about this construction is that there are some lines uh, here on the deck. Do you see like the uh, dark uh, wooden beams here that se uh, separate the deck into different regions? This, my mentor explained, was a technique of uh, traditional Chinese shipbuilding uh, called watertight compartments. And the uh, goal behind this, uh, this form of construction, or the purpose uh, from an engineering perspective, was threefold. The first purpose of having the ship separated into se uh, separate compartments was to divide different kinds of cargo. So grain could be separated from fish and livestock um, and into these different containers. The second purpose was to prevent cargo from shifting during the voyage. And the third purpose was to minimize the damage of a leak. Because say, for example, the ship, like the unlucky Stetson, crashed into a, into a jagged, jagged reef or a rock, uh, the damage would hopefully be contained to just one or two of these self-contained uh, boxes, and it wouldn't spread throughout the vessel. So it minimizes some of the damage that could have happened from a collision. This technique of construction, uh, the watertight compartments, uh, existed in Chinese shipbuilding for many, many centuries. And it wasn't until more recently that it was adapted into Western shipbuilding. And here I have an interesting quote from uh, Benjamin Franklin. He, he describes uh, implementing this technique in a letter, where he says, as these vessels are not to be laden with goods, their holds may, without inconvenience, be divided into separate apartments after the Chinese manner, and each of these apartments caulked tight so as to keep out water. So what Franklin is describing here is the technique of watertight compartments which has uh, an important benefit for the safety of, uh, of a vessel. Inside of the compartment, you can see a replica of a shrine to the goddess Mazu, the goddess of the sea. Keep the goddess of the sea in mind. She makes a reappearance later. There are many other fascinating details about the ship's construction, which I'd love to talk with you about, uh, more about uh, if we have time later, including how the sails are constructed and uh, the interlocking beams of, 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 the, of the vessel. The next thing that I'd like to get to is to recall the fascinating story of one of the greatest seafarers who ever sailed such a vessel. That's the story of Admiral Zheng He. Uh, this is a reenactment made by the museum staff. So keep in mind that these are all employees of the museum who, in their free time, dressed up in full costume and uh, made an hour-long video about the voyages of Zheng He. And I'll, I'll have a clip, for, clip of that in a minute. But I'd first like to introduce a little bit about Admiral Zheng He. Here he stands on the uh, museum's Fu Junk. 
he was an explorer of the 1400s who was uh, sent on many voyages in the Ming Dynasty. Now, I'll give you the, that, uh, that reenactment clip. I'll play that reenactment clip now. It's quite, quite exciting. Nimeng,将要去国万里,开创国王经来,从未有过的工业,正羡慕你们啊,为盼你们身处海外,如在朝廷,谨遵天道,克守律令。此的盘晚,正,他,告诉世人,中国人来过。These are various clips from the movie, all spliced together, because it's an hour long total. And here, the goddess of the sea makes a reappearance in the form of uh, Ms. Kong, somebody from my department in <laughs> education. <laughs> seven voyages in the span of 28 years, which helped uh, for a time to make China the leading maritime power of that age. And uh, in his travels, Zheng He brought an understanding of Chinese culture to people far and wide, and also brought back many foreign goods that had never been seen before in China. After the death of Zheng He, China found it increasingly difficult to fund this expensive exploration. And so a new emperor banned the const construction of long distance ships. Thus, China's brief era of naval expansion was over. Currently, China is engaged in a large-scale infrastructure project called the Belt and Road Initiative. This map is quite reminiscent of the explorations of Admiral Zheng He. This, this project, investment project includes the development of port facilities, railroads, and highways in the Asia-Pacific area, as well as Central and Eastern Europe. So it's interesting to see the historical connections between uh, the four, uh, 1400s exploration and infrastructure projects in the country today. Now, in the history of Europe's uh, voyages of exploration, there was one a constant problem for sailors, which was scurvy. Does anyone know what what is what scurvy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this deficiency can occur as a result of a diet that's low in fruits and vegetables, which often occurred for sailors when they were on long voyages at sea and couldn't take with them uh, lots of food supplies. So, does anyone know a cure that was eventually found for limes, limes. limes, limes and lemons? The citrus, uh, it found, was found that citrus juice in 1747, it was demonstrated that citrus juice could uh, prevent the onset of scurvy. But it wasn't until 1800, that, the year 1800, that this began to be put into regular practice, the administering of citrus juice to sailors. And so between the 16th and 18th century, uh, over an estimated 2 million sailors died as a result of uh, uh, scurvy. But on my first day at the China Maritime Museum, uh, somebody from my department explained that in the history of Chinese maritime exploration, scurvy was not a big, uh, big challenge for the sailors. And the reason for this I thought was quite surprising. It was because the sailors, during their daily diet, would drink some green tea. The green tea doesn't have enough vitamin C to be considered a healthy daily dose, but it's enough to ward off the onset of scurvy. This, uh, this product was able to help prevent the devastating condition of scurvy. And so I was thinking more about this story after, uh, after I heard it on my many days at the museum. And I thought that it 
shows that there can be many mutual gains to be had from cultural exchange, that sharing this sort of knowledge can be useful to everyone. So one of the things that I brought to China was sea shanties. And I had learned many sea shanties here at the Baokutha when I was in fifth grade. And I'll play a, play a short video. <laughs> Here, uh, my uh, fellow uh, K students can relate to this as our trip to the Baku. <laughs> At the end of my uh, time there at the museum, I gave a presentation about how I became interested in maritime history and uh, also talked about the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. And I'll play a brief clip from that presentation.旧金山海事博物馆有着悠久的历史，他们收藏的收藏了几艘古老的船，还古定期的开展各种活动。但是很多游客不知道海事博物馆还有一个对外开放的图书馆，你随时可以来看他们的藏藏书、图片、报纸
grateful to have had the opportunity to begin to learn a little bit more about my favorite subject of maritime history. I think that maritime history is a field unlike any other, in that it's not just the history of one particular place, but it's about the interconnectedness of all of these places, all of these ports across the world, the exchange of goods and ideas, and I think that to study this uh, maritime history requires a collaboration across numerous institutions. So I hope that in the future, there could be greater collaboration between scholars and museums in both the United States and in China about maritime history, and that people look to share historical resources and expertise. Thank you all very much to come, for coming to my presentation. Time to open up for questions. Let's see, Jim. Question in the back: um, What what kind of people come to the museum there? I mean, what are, what are they looking to <coughs> discover? Like, like our museum, we get a lot of uh, people that are involved in the maritime trades. Uh, you know, a lot of geologists, a lot of. Like, so, what what kind of person comes to the museum? As there's a particularly large amount of a uh, large number of um, young students who go to the museum. This may also be because it's the summer and. Kids are off from school, and that's what I what I saw every day. But there were I saw that there were often large school groups that went through the museum. But I think that there's also people from all walks of life who come to the Maritime Museum because that they're interested in that subject. The ship inside the museum was that a replica or was that like that that was a replica that the museum built mm -hmm. in 2006 when they're uh, building the museum. Um, but it was based on uh, old uh, paintings and uh, written written records. And interestingly, that, that ship there, that blue junk that I, that I showed earlier in that video, uh, is a, would be about a medium-sized vessel for Admiral Zheng He's fleet. And they described that he also had some very large vessels and some smaller vessels that were, went with him um, in his fleet of, for his exploration. On the junk, you can see in the um, sails, like all these cross hatches. Are the, is that batting? Is that a are those bats to stiff in it or what? In in the in the sails, there are um, wooden. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is. Kind of like a long battens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wooden battens, and that allows them to uh, uh, just pull off the sail in one piece. Whereas in uh, usually in Western sailing ships, you have to. Um, have it in two pieces, so sometimes people will scale the mast and uh, extend two or three pieces of, of the sail, whereas that goes up in, in one piece. So Pierce, I read somewhere, I, I don't know if you knew this or not, did uh, John Hay have uh, 300 ships in his, in his fleet? That's, I think that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that there uh, is some discussion about the number of ships and the size of the ships, mm -hmm. because it, not all of the record from that time was preserved till today. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to return to visit anytime soon? I mean, that would be really cool, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll have, have to see um, how, how things go, and um, if, there, if another opportunity arises, I would really love to go back to, to this mu museum again. I'm curious what the vocabulary difference is like, like you know, like speaking Chinese here, mm -hmm. uh, and then speaking a very, about like a very specific technical subject was like the yeah. vocabulary challenging. I, I, when I first got there, there were a lot of terms that I had to learn about um, ships and vessels, and my mentor was really uh, uh, helped me a lot with that by going around the museum and explaining all different exhibits. And but what I noticed most about the language challenge for me was um, Shanghainese, because <laughs> in Shanghai a lot of people speak uh, either uh, a di downtown uh, Shanghai dialect or a dialect that's more common in the area that. Uh, that I was, and so sometimes people, uh, we'd, be, we'd be at lunch and some people would just go full out into a conversation in, in Shanghainese, and I was just like, just sitting there, not <laughs> talking about it for a while, so, uh, because I, I can't, I couldn't understand it um, from just, just knowing Mandarin. So how were the, the children learning to sing the shanties? So they were, um, in that, that clip you saw that it was part of the uh, museum's uh, trial experiential learning program. 
and that's been going on, this is the second summer now that it's been going, um, but the sea shanty activity was just added this summer. So they come to the museum for a day and they do some different activities, but they're all supposed to be very um, experiential learning kind of activities, not like sitting down and just doing homework or tests or that, that kind of thing. It's supposed to be more engaging kind of activities. And so they go around the, the museum, uh, try out a lot of different activities throughout the museum, and then uh, when, when they want to, they can go to my station to learn sea shanties, which is mine's one of about a dozen different stations. And so then how did you should, prepare the music for them? They were reading off the page. Oh, yeah. Who were they reading? I printed out a, a lyric sheet where I have the English lyrics on one side and then an explanation of the song in Chinese on the back, as well as like a um, guide to some of the more challenging uh, English vocabulary. So then, but well, a lot of students got uh, really excited about learning the songs once once they got into them. That, that was I found that really fun. I'm curious what the people at the Chinese Maritime Museum thought of you in terms of what they were expecting <laughs> versus what showed up at the door. I, I think that like that I really bonded with all really well, uh, pe the people at the museum and that. Uh, I made, made a lot of uh, really great friendships. I think a lot of people were surprised too that, uh, that, I could, that I could speak Mandarin. And I felt like from the preparation from Chinese American International School and from my Chinese classes in high school, that I didn't really have any like, difficulty in communicating any of, any of my ideas at work. Did any of them speak English? In China, uh, currently everybody starts learning, or well, almost everybody starts learning uh, English in first grade. But a lot of people aren't um, very comfortable, especially kids aren't comfortable with just speaking uh, speaking in English because they it's up on the classroom setting and it's just like it can be stressful to try to speak in a, in a foreign language. But there were uh, there was one person in my department in particular who um, had majored in English in college, and so he and I always really like to work together on uh, work, reviewing some translations for for the for the museum where we. Um, or he would he would do a translation first and then run that by me, like does that sound like something a native, a native speaker would say, and then I could uh, we could collaborate on that. You mentioned the uh, Belt and Road project that's going to span decades. How much was the museum involved in that? How often did you hear about it during the course of your stay? That's that's a really good question. The museum actually the construction of the museum. And it's, uh, the museum's life basically is the same as the life of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the museum was built uh, a couple of years before the Belt and Road Initiative was announced. And there are several aspects of the museum that tie into the Belt and Road Initiative. So for example, one recent exhibit was called China and the World. And the exhibit was about uh, trade in China in the uh, 1400s and 1500s and uh, what had been recovered from shipwrecks, but there were also aspects, uh, parts of parts of the exhibit that would show how this linked to uh, current developments and the Belt and Road Initiative. And a uh, quote from Xi Jinping. Who are all those people up there with you? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> this is from the museum's three-day summer camp, which um, was that most summer camps are just uh, single day. You just uh, you don't spend it, over, spend it overnight at the museum, but in this summer camp, they uh, not spent one day at the museum, but then uh, got to travel to visit a lot of other maritime sites in the, in the area. So this is actually at the uh, Shanghai Maritime University, where they have this big ship sitting in concrete, uh, where uh, uh, maritime university students in training go onto this ship and uh, do like drills and exercises on the vessel. And we got to have a tour uh, of the vessel uh, as part of this uh, camp. And I, I accompanied the, uh, the camp for these, these three days. This is me here with my uh, mentor in the, in the front row. How were the students selected to go to the camp? And how is it paid for? This camp is free and funded by the museum, but it's on a first come, first serve basis. So as soon as it was announced, we were getting uh, applications all the time, and all these people calling us. Um, so there, there actually are a lot of people that have to be turned away from the camp because it only, you can only accept the first 50 or so people usually for each camp. 
but it's uh, free and on a first come first serve basis. So, Pierce, the, uh, the museum's name was in English. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything beyond that in English in the museum itself? There, most of the um, exhibits uh, were also did also have um, English translations, yeah. wow. but then maybe like a quarter to a half uh, are just in Chinese. Um, usually, the kind of more the technical things and th things that would take more effort to translate and would be worth uh, translating. Um, but most of the explanations and everything in the museum were all all had Chinese and English, and also there are English guided tours of the museum. Did you see a lot of non-Chinese tourism in the? No, not not very much at all. This, this is a pretty uh, is pretty far from the city center, so you really have to be like maritime history has to be your thing. <laughs> you're going to go two hours on the subway to, to see this museum. Pierce, what's developing around this area? I mean, it sounds to me like it was nothing several years ago. Yeah, what, yeah. what else is being developed in that region? My my mentor described that when he was young. Uh, this whole, that whole area was, um, a lot of it was just marshlands and uh, a kind of a, a fishing village. And he recalls when he was young that he would uh, walk, walk around in the marshes and could uh, catch uh, various, like, very shellfish. And all, uh, uh, so he would, he would say that he would regularly catch crabs and things like that um, around his house. But now it's all concrete and very uh, large buildings. This, the particular area that I uh, lived in was called uh, Lingan, and it's uh, a, a new neighborhood that uh, primarily has the Maritime Museum and then um, some other uh, new schools that have built, been built in the area. But a lot of the buildings for now are, are, still, have, are still quite empty because they haven't uh, yet received a lot of uh, people moving away from the city. When you lived on your own in the apartment, were you cooking for yourself? <laughs> I actually, I, there were, I was, I just was very fortunate to have a great uh, noodle shop right next to my apartment. <laughs> I knew like everybody who worked there. <laughs> but most of my meals I actually ate at the museum cafeteria, but whenever I was, I had enough of the museum cafeteria, it was that shop next to my <laughs> Are there any more questions? If not, then we can, uh, I can be happy to talk to you more after this. <laughs>